Akshay uh, from the University of Glasgow. Uh, and I'll be making a few remarks on the two films now. So uh, let me begin by saying what Surabhi would have said if she were here, uh, that her film is not about Bidesia, the folk form. She was compelled to engage with its contemporary mutations instead. Therefore, in one fundamental way, these two are very different films. While Sharma's film is a documentation of the Bhojpuri music as it thrives among Bhojpuri, uh, among Bhojpuri speaking Mumbai based migrants, Maharshi's film is a reflection upon Tamasha and documents its official reconstruction by the students of state funded National School of Drama. We should use these films to distinguish between the two circuits in which the vernacular and the folk are reimagined, the, the official and the popular. The distinction drawn here is not that of their meaning, but their flow. The state-recognized folk forms may tra travel back to the people through recognized artists, such as Madhubai of Kanpur's Notanki, but they're not improvisationally born from within the modern constraints that determine the course of their consumption. One could also argue that both Bidesia and Tamasha traditionally thrived as variety entertainment forms, in which the central dramatic piece is interrupted, punctuated, or ornamented by the more playful or risque songs and dances. Bidesia, that I know a little more about, has its rural variants in Londa Nach, which is female impersonating dancer, and metropolitan variants where the central dramatic piece could be entirely done away with. In a sense, the trajectory of these entertainment forms is that of adaptation, leaving the discourse of purity to the industry of nostalgia. The terms on which they are celebrated within distinct spatial confines are determined by the habitus they address. As Ramanuj Pathak says in Sharma's film, the rural and the metropolitan both mourn their lost other, even as they spice up their imaginative enterprise. It is notable that most of the Bhojpuri music in Mumbai is about a male singer addressing an all-male audience and singing about how their women folk back in rural UP or Bihar would be desiring them. This is not merely a celebration of desire, but a collective fantasy of being desired. The music narratively produces the men as subjects entitled to mobility, carriers of desirable commodities and their own desires, all coming together to quench the provincial desire of their female counterparts. The meaning radically changes when such a song is performed in Mumbai so, sorry. <laughs> to, to an all-male audience, as opposed to a diverse rural audience comprising the young and the old, the men and, as well as the women. Also, it is not so much the category of folk that needs to be distinguished here as much as that of performance. Both the films document what could be called body genres. These are forms of performative conversation that deploy the indecent, ashisht, as one of the people in Maharshi film says as the axis along which the conversations are often arranged. The indecent, by the virtue of being otherwise unacceptable, stages a dialogue by proxy. It challenges not so much the substance, but the form of the normative, performatively. What could also be said is, the, is that the act of rebuilding, an essential trope in Sharma's film, serves as an adequate metaphor for the nature of performances we're speaking of. The illegality and demolition drives, displacement and land encroachment, are all acts of appropriation, of reclaiming entitlement. But this reclama reclamation is not legal, it does not even protest, it adjusts. As you demolish, they rebuild. If demolish again, they submit and, and still rebuild. There's a drive here to not displace, but sit beside, rebuild with the leftover resources at one's disposal. Language, politics and traditions all are present here in their residual forms, uh, aggregated into a polyphonic mode of address. It is this address that can include not only Hindi, but even Marathi. Bidesia here can be blended with Lamni. The dancers can come from Bihar, Banaras, Wapi, or rural Maharashtra. The act of rebuilding is also an act of strategic aggregations and coalitions. Contemporary vernacularity is not an autonomous circuit or resource. It is not a counter-public sphere or a challenge to the, to the mainstream, but an act of rebuilding in coalition with new technologies, upcoming neighborhoods, and countless new artists but also with older resources such as caste. There are at least three ways in which this pool of vernacular performance has become a resource for cinema in India. First, within Hindi cinema, presenting its case as a national cinema, it provided provincial inflections that would support the case of the national without being identified as such. 
Second, when the national cinema branched out against, it po against its popular mainstream variant towards the state-funded social realism, uh, the vernacular performance named as such identified the region and therefore social realism as a more authentic representation of the national. Third, within the vernacular or regional cinema, such as Bhojpuri, the proximity causes deep discomfort for a borrowed melodramatic form more interested in establishing its relatively cosmopolitan lineage. Performance on film finds itself handcuffed, merely serving the orientation of the filmic ensemble. Also, performing bodies never entirely escape the gendered vocabulary. The vernacular comes to represent cultural as well as territorial location, primarily through the male body. When inscribed upon the female body, it loses its territorial assertion, which is distracted or diffused by the orientations of desire. Sharma's film and Bhojpuri music at large illustrate this variously. Uh, one case there would be that of Kalpana Patwari, the singer who was being featured repeatedly. Kalpana is the most prominent Bhojpuri singer who, who made a career out of singing popular and, and very sexy, vulgar songs. Uh, but here, in this film, she's trying to cleanse her image, and she's, she's being featured as the artist who's performing Bihari Thakur's album, uh, which is, in a sense, a return to the classical roots of, of the folk form. So, so this, is, this is a part of the canonization uh, through which she's also establishing, re-establishing herself. And, and as you see in one of the one of, uh, moments in the film, she clearly says, no, nothing for the public. Uh, I'll only do it for Bikhari Thakur. So. Uh, my name is Anuja Jain, and uh, I'm a guest faculty in the uh, MISAS uh, at Columbia University. And I write on documentary film. And so my interest in particularly these films is uh, to look at them more within a reflection on what does it mean for these films uh, within the Indian documentary film history. So uh, the two broad points which I'm going to make uh, would be to set up this context for opening up a discussion. First would be about, like I said, uh, the significance of these films within the Indian documentary film history. And I'm particularly interested, especially in the tradition of art and documentary, art and culture documentaries, uh, which is a category which was consolidated by the Films Division of India, the official documentary and news reproduction agency. And then second, I want to further open it up uh, to interrogate the meaning and implications of performance of the popular through indigenous traditions like Bhojpuri music and Tamasha. So following Indian independence in 1947, in 1948, the government of India established the Films Division of India the, under the aegis of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Among different categories, arts and culture documentaries one, one, were one of the dominant classifications for film production by the Films Division. The art and cultural documentaries, as they were defined and consolidated, they portrayed India's natural regional cultural diversity. These films represented culture as a tangible artifact, object or visible practice that could be located in a specific time and place from Madhubani paintings from Bihar in Eastern India, to temple carvings from the Ajanta Caves in Western India, to Kathakali dancers from the southern state of Kerala. On display were the discrete, almost hermetically sealed words indexed by each of these distinctive cultural forms and practices. In reflecting on the special predilection for the folk and other vernacular art forms, the location of culture was invariably non-urban, and classical. The gaze of the Films Division documentaries was almost exclusively directed towards pre-lapsarian vistas of colorful exuberance that constituted Indianness as a collection of exotic others. No matter who the audience was, the indigenous performative traditions were always presented with a sense of something forgotten, something unknown or hidden that could be presented before the audience as a result of what Films Division officials described as their painstaking labors of cultural recuperation and excavation. Being part of the larger agenda of the Films Division, constituting a distinctive identity for the newly independent state 
as an authoritative representative of the Indian nation, these films underscored the role of the state as the sole preserver of this scattered heritage, united only by the eye of the statist camera. This gaze of recovering the real culture continued to inform the art and culture documentaries even within the independent non-statist documentary practices through the past few decades. Within this documentary tradition, Surbhi Sharma's Bidesia in Bombay and Sanjay Meharishi's The Making of Tamasha breaks away from the assumed and accepted tropes of representing the imaginary of the vernacular. Instead of creating a spatial difference between the audience and the subject of the films to contribute to that sense that real culture was inevitably located elsewhere, it is through the retelling of the everyday that each film seeks to map the search for terms through which new traditions can be potentially reconfigured in a world where methods and spaces of storytelling are rapidly changing in contemporary India. Uh, I would suggest that unlike the statist case, the two films don't aim to recover and remember the forgotten to, comm to commemorate the national that is marked by the classical arts distinctive but essentially unified regional particularities. Instead, in both the films, we see popular performance allowing for, the re for a reconfiguration of the subjectivities that are outside the dominant, the migrants and the artists. The film shows us how by merging traditional with the contemporary, the raw and the vulgar with the fine, the habitual with the experimental, the music and performance allows everyone from the Bhojpuri migrant worker to the singer to the Tamasha performer to mobilize new identities. Hello, I'm Anupama Kapse. I uh, teach at Queen's College, City University of New York. Uh, I work primarily on uh, silent and early Indian sound cinema and melodrama. And I have to say that I am watching the making of Tamasha for the first time. So my remarks are very, very uh, preliminary, and I know there are many people here in the audience who know a lot more about these films. So I just wanted to qualify everything that I'm saying. And please, uh, uh, I hope if uh, you have uh, questions, we can talk about these uh, issues, because I really have more questions than answers. So one of my questions was, um, what draws audiences to Tamasha or Bidesia when they can watch a movie for less, for less, for the price of a, uh, I don't know, 50, you know, single screen, 50 rupees, 100 rupees. Uh, and Akshay was telling me it could cost up to 200 rupees to watch a performance of uh, uh, the kind that we watched in Bidesia. And second, uh, my other question is about what it means to talk about the vernacular vis-a-vis -vis film. And I'm drawing on Veena Narigal's work here. If um, the coming of independence involved the transformation of vernacular means, oral means of storytelling into print cultures. I think in the case of cinema, uh, it calls the vernac the tra this transformation calls for the transformation of folk idioms into mass cultural idioms. And I saw that most prominently in Videsia in the use of the cell phone. Uh, which is a recurring uh, part of the film. It's also how people who are on the margins have access, define their access to technology and their use of technology. So I thought that was an interesting point of transition from the vernacular to uh, the mass, uh, to mass media or uh, mass uh, culture. And also, of course, the circulation and transmission of uh, the songs depended in a very crucial way on the use of the cell phone. Second, uh, and both of you have already mentioned this, the use of the female body. Uh, I thought Surbi in particular, perhaps because she is uh, a woman, uh, did at times foreground female agency, particularly through the voice, which makes itself available to, uh, uh, to um, dissent, if I can use a strong word, or at least subversion of dominant forms of performance. But it is quite clear that uh, the, the, uh, uh, that uh, in, in Videsia and also in uh, Making of the Masha, the female body uh, is a kind of point on which 
the transition from the regional to the national is defined, or the traffic between uh, popular and dominant uh, forms uh, is conducted. And regulation, of course, involves control of the female body and its performative space. And particularly in uh, Sanjay Maharishi's film, I felt that Lavani's sexual, sexual address was de-emphasized and um, responding here to uh, Anuja's point, that that was perhaps the place where uh, Tamasha as a kind of semi-rural form makes its transition to uh, you know, the kind of performative freedom that an institution like NSD offers to the female performer. I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, and last, I mean, I just have a couple of, again, very preliminary points to make. Um, I thought both um, Videsia and Making of the Masha were almost in a kind of mirror-like relationship to each other. It was very interesting to watch both films together. I noticed a number of times male performers said in Venezia that they did not have the freedom to perform a particular kind of song or that the public wanted their audience, whether it was the taxi driver or the worker in the building, wanted a particular kind of sexualized performance which was in demand. Whereas in um, Sanjay Maharishi's film, that was precisely what um, was you know, re redefined or, um, or understood within a, a sort of vocabulary of freedom. I have the freedom to talk about Lavani or perform Lavani as uh, something that has nine different dressers. Uh, can, it's not only sexual, but has many functions. And I'm thinking of a film like Ramzoshi, which was made by uh, Prabhat, um, uh, which also sought to take Lavni out of this uh, popular or, or uh, save it from the taint of the popular and bring it into a sort of nationalist discourse. And I think that started to, you know, that, that started to emerge in uh, the discourse of uh, freedom. Finally, I think melodrama and the state have always had a very complex relationship. And if we are thinking about melodrama, through the popular idioms of uh, Tamasha, Lavani, Pavada, all of these forms, then I think that needs to be um, uh, thought out more carefully. The state always representing here some form of regulation, some form of control, and the folk, of course, addressing a, a broader, uh, more diverse, and uh, obviously, at times, conflicting uh, constituency. Thank you. So, it's open to questions. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering, those of you who know more about phenomenon than I do, also talk about this relationship that I think is a little more complicated with a documentary than it is with a Bollywood film. Right? But those of us who are, <clears throat> I date myself here, but old enough to remember Nimbuda. <laughs> um, uh, where, you know, this started out, quote unquote, as a folk dance, folk song, became famous through the Ashwari Arai version, and then you had all these little kids performing it in talent shows and things like that, performing the Ashwari Arai version, but, at, and, but uh, uh, framing it as a sort of authentic folk uh, dance. And I, I've seen that recently with Chamak Cholo. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a little more bizarre, right? <laughs> but uh, in other words, I, you know, there is this sort of back and forth between the quote-unquote folk dance, and I, uh, I like the term vernacular much more than these other terms. So I'm grateful <laughs> for the title of this conference. But I, I wonder if you could speak to some of the ways in which the the form the, the genres that are documented in the documentary and been inflicted back and forth by the film already before they're documented. Is there, I'm not quite sure what my question is, but I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that relationship between the live performance and the film and how they continue to influence each other's development. And, um, I think just to add to that, the complicated that a little bit. I happened to go to Jaisalmer at one point, uh, much after the Nidhi Chukhi so uh, 
and we, we were attending a performance by some of these folk musicians and they performed Nimbuda. And when they performed Nimbuda, they performed it as their song, which they've been performing for a very long time. Uh, but the people who were with me, I mean, it was a huge group, uh, they were not only disappointed with the version being performed, they, they were saying that this is a corruption of, of the film song. I mean, it's, a, it's such a shoddy version of that. I mean, you could sing your own songs. Why, why spoil the film songs? So, I mean, there, there is that element as well. A certain memory, in a sense, the folk is, or the vernacular, has a location. It, it is confined by a certain spatial, cultural memory. And once, once a figment of that is nationalized by, by the film, because film has a, a completely different uh, distributive mechanism. So once that, a, a form of that becomes national memory, everything else is, is essentially a, a, a local corruption of that. So, so what is at work here is, is the spatiality of, of a cultural phenomenon, as I understand it. At the same time, though, it's also, uh, it's also interesting that, for instance, in Bedesia and uh, in some other forms of, of that kind, uh, when they dance, it's actually, it's, it's very hard to make out the distinction between, let's say, a certain kind of Bollywood dance and what might be thought of as some notion of authenticity yeah. uh, of the vernacular, folk, popular, whatever it's one wants to call it. On the other hand, in, in Tamasha, for instance, uh, that doesn't seem to have happened. In Tamasha, the dances, not just in this movie, yeah. but also if you actually see Tamasha, uh, the actual performance, um, the dance steps, the moves, etc., etc., are still relatively unaffected by Bollywood. But and I'm just wondering how, can it, how that works. Yeah, can it, I, I, I'm wondering like what you were pointing out, and I noticed this too with the Tamasha. I'm wondering if that can explain to the more larger politics of the national and regional <coughs> cinema itself, the constitution <coughs> within uh, Indian popular culture, because uh, with the Bollywood, uh, the Bollywood assuming this kind of a, uh, essentially Hindi language cinema, assuming this kind of a national uh, position, I, I uh, wonder that is it then its appropriation of certain forms becomes kind of normalized and part of that larger uh, culture and the tamasha being like here I'm thinking of the film which which I and which I just taught which is uh, Bhumika. The uh, Shyam Benegal's Bhumika, which, which talks about Tamasha, but again, it continues to, even within the film, it continues to uh, occupy that space of the margins, like within as being the art form. So, I'm wondering if that politics also comes to inform that which <coughs> vernacular art forms become part of the national, or as what Akshay was saying, the larger cultural memory. So, I, I'm thinking that that might be the one way to understand that why those distinctions are much more uh, there within the a form like Tamasha and not so much within the Bhojpuri because of this larger uh, confluence which has been there. It yeah, might I also could, have sorry. to do with migration, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right, yeah. It might simply just be the fact that one gets laid in the big city, in the metropolis, Bombay, right. etc. and the other is still, you know, relatively a Rural form. Right. Again, I just want to share my experience here. Whenever I go to Pune to work in the film archive, I always make it a point to see a Lavani performance or a Tamasha <coughs> performance. And uh, I have to say that uh, I've seen a lot of variation in how much they draw from cinema. And uh, I have also had to travel far to see a Lavani performance out of the city as opposed to seeing a Sangeet Natak which they still perform occasionally in uh, Gandharva Natak Mandali in Pune. So I think it varies quite a bit. And perhaps, you know, each, as, as we were seeing in Videsia also, uh, when they were performing songs for the engineers, they tended to address them differently uh, as opposed to, you know, this larger audience that wanted the item numbers. So I think there must be variation uh, 
And again, this is just based on my experience. Uh, yes. okay. uh, very short points, but unfortunately I didn't see the days yet this morning. I missed it. But in the, uh, in the Kamasha one, I, I was curious, especially in view of the discussion that's been going on in what Dr. Khan said. Uh, what I noticed was, in fact, the opposite. The, the very ending, the last excerpt that we saw, in acts, especially in terms of the female role for the female body, it seems to enact incorrectly, if I'm not, but she's, it's a very termogen, shoeish kind of female body, right, that does, sort of walks off with a man in a very, um, you know, enacting a certain very, uh, particular very sexist trope. So I'm curious what you're basing your uh, thoughts on, uh, you know, in terms of the, the reversal or at least kind of opening up of gender roles in Tamasha. And, I guess the other thing I have that I also noticed in terms of this Bollywood imagery is but in, in the making of the Masha was that there was a sex segment where we saw, which I thought was very um, Bollywood, the use of Bollywood in a very ironic way. So, and I'm curious if that's also a way for uh, the NS, you know, NSV students and coming up out of a very particular space, that they can play with that as a way to recuperate something that seems authentic. Um, so those are my two points. And also just very interested in you raised a question about you know what is it that draws audiences to Tamasha in rural areas because you know, they do have access to to movies and, and other kinds of things, uh, right? I mean, and, and in some ways that, that might even be cheaper. Uh, I'm, I'm curious because I know that for example in Pakistan, which is the area that I work on, for Tamasha, which used to be you know, like Bali Jati and that all, that's dead. I mean, and part of it is uh, state neglect, the party is also just the time. There's, they, they can't make ends meet. That's been dead for a long, long time. Uh, so commercial theater has sort of taken up some of those things that used to be in the vernacular. But other than that, it's dead. No, again, uh, I have to say I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I uh, am. When I was talking about uh, the address, uh, I was, I think, also drawing on my experience of watching those performances in Pune. Uh, those were more lewd, whereas the NST performance was contained within a, a sort of a system of address uh, that was like, we are, you know, we are helping Lavani. We, we want to bring it back into a sort of, uh, you know, respectable, performative space. I, I, I felt that just in terms of my own experience of watching an actual performance where the lighting, the music, the loudspeakers, all of that uh, is very Bollywood um, and uh, also lewd in a way that uh, this is not lewd. I'll give you an example from uh, the 1930s when Devika Rani, uh, a famous star of the 1930s, ran away with her driver you know, she was still able to recover from that because it was Devika Rani. Whereas lesser actresses, you know, who had done something like that could not recover from the taint of doing something so rebellious. So it has something to do with class. It has something to do with the legitimacy that N NSD provides. And that's what I wanted to just think about a little bit. But again, I'm not an expert. I also wanted to say I was drawing on uh, Sharmila Rege's work on uh, Lavni uh, in, in uh, a lot of the things that I was saying. Uh, I just wanted to quickly respond to the two points here. One, uh, my understanding is that uh, okay, film, uh, the, the crucial distinction there is, is the distributive mechanism. I mean, because the distributive infrastructure of film is, is held by a very strong industry, it's not something very easy to penetrate into. In fact, film economy works as an effect of a healthy live show economy. So this, this is prior to film. Uh, in, in Bhojpuri, that provenance is, is very healthily established. Uh, Late, late 80s is when, through cassette technologies, this phenomenon started becoming extremely big. And uh, earlier, there were, there were uh, Bidesia parties, uh, which, which then started uh, finding competition in orchestras. And orchestras were the first entrants uh, of the filmy variety. Uh, and then, of course, 
as I know, from drawing upon Brahma Prakash's work in particular, who's done some work on this, uh, Londa Nach, which is the female impersonating dance, uh, gets segregated to only the lower caste villages, while the upper castes, particularly the Rajputs, Thakurs, they start going only for orchestras. So, so they, the, these, uh, the, these performative genres ac start acquiring an ideological uh, you know, meaning. Uh, and through that, th these, these different, but of course, wh when they travel to urban uh, confines, pe places like Delhi and Bombay, this is laid out not ideologically, but in, in terms of genrefication. So, so it's um, very different. But if, you, if a certain economy is able to draw huge numbers, then does, the distributors would be willing to take the risk uh, to release a certain film in, in a certain number of theaters. And then it becomes, you know, so through that the film economy can work. Uh, the, also, another distinction between Bhojpuri economy and, and the Tamasha thing is that uh, Bhojpuri economy works precisely because it provides a route to Bombay. The, the, the location of the film industry is Bombay. The location of the music industry is Delhi and Bombay. But uh, the, a huge audience for the music industry is in Bombay. And this is, this is all about you know, big, uh, taking, that, taking that route and going away. So, so in a sense, it, it tries to draw upon a much larger referential vocabulary uh, and, and appeal to not only Bhojpuri, uh, the, the idioms located in Kajri, Chaiti, Birha, etc., which are within the realm of the Bhojpuri, but a much wider realm, uh, which would appeal to even Abdi and Braj speaking people, or from where, again, a smaller percentage of working class people would be coming to Bombay. So, um, so unfortunately, we have one more question. Yeah, that, that, that would be part of it. Yes. Yes. No, you see, on the, on the uh, Tamasha movie, uh, the documentary, what was interesting was the contrast between Tamasha as it's actually done in rural setting and the NSD production. Yeah. And the differences were yeah. very, very striking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for instance, the, the actual Tamasha group, for instance, stagecraft like there's almost no conception of any blocking. Yeah. Which, yeah. Right? I mean, there's just one set of microphones, front stage, center, everybody comes and delivers the line into the microphone. Uh, this is done away with the NSD production because that's a far more sophisticated yeah. way of. But the interesting thing is, of course, that the NSD is also very careful not to do violence to the original form. Yeah. So both. But what I was interested in was this: the fact that the, you know whether there is there is Bollywood influence on on the. Uh, in fact, point was made. Uh, you had these Bollywood choreographed things and they, one of those performances. Uh, but that is actually a live form which subsists on the basis of a market. I mean, what, uh, 50,000, 100,000 per performance, etc., etc. NSD does not have any of that uh, burden, right? It's a state-sponsored thing. doesn't depend on public response. So I was wondering, what the status of this NSD performance would be in relation to this other life form, which is clearly evolving. Unnamed elite institution dabbling in a vernacular form. <laughs> 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 